Okay, um, time to talk about archaeology now. Does this like ar uh, look like archaeology to you? It is, but it just looks like a mess now, right? But if we bother to step back and look at the many ways in which our archaeological data uh, relates to each other, things emerge that might actually make sense in the past. And that is what this talk will be all about. I'll be talking about the potential, as I see it, of a complex network research perspective for archaeology uh, and how we've applied it uh, to the Urban Connectivity Project, uh, this, which is directed by Professor Simon Kay and Graham Earl at the University of Southampton. Now, as Max mentioned in his introduction, um, network analysis has been applied in archaeology before, uh, but it was only until the uh, early 2000s uh, that a lot of archaeological applications emerged, and this citation network here represents that. It, uh, includes all the uh, archaeological and historical applications of network analysis that I am aware of and how they cite other publications. And if you look at the core of this network, you get a very interesting pattern. Those nodes there, mentioned uh, colored in green, are uh, not archaeological publications. They're publications that are uh, very prominent in physics and in social network analysis. Now that's not, a, that's not really a problem and that's not very surprising, but it's from that previous network we just extract those archaeological and historical applications of network analysis. We get a totally different structure. We get a network that is much less dense and um, much less connected to each other, um, which kind of gives me the idea that archaeological network analysts are actually not that well networked themselves. They hardly talk to each other. Uh, they are hardly aware of their own uh, of, of each other's work, um, which is surprising because some of them, like uh, Bentley and Mashner's work, have adopted in 2001 uh, complex uh, networks models. Which, which they show have a lot of potential for archaeology, but uh, have not really took off. And if we compare this with uh, Google Scholar and Web of Knowledge citations, we can kind of conclude that, in essence, these publications don't really have a big impact, and not really in the archaeological discipline, believe me. Um, now, this is just um, uh, one thing I kind of want to stress very quickly. I think it has a lot of potential, a complex network research perspective, but it has to be explored through collaboration. And uh, that's why a lot of um, sessions and uh, conferences are coming up. We're organizing one ourselves in Southampton. And we've also got discussions group, discussion groups. We're also very interested in uh, how to visualize these complex networks, but still make them look kind of archaeological, you know, kind of stressing the materiality. And this uh, network here, well, this logo uh, was created by the artist Ian Kirkpatrick. And I think he did an amazing job in stressing that materiality by kind of through that complexity, a coin emerges which actually has a dent in it and, and shows uh, the, the, the way the coin was struck from the metal, uh, which kind of gives people an impression that it's ancient, that it's archaeology, that it's material, something that was made by individuals, but also something that emerges by looking at uh, the, the bigger thing. Now, that was a brief introduction. Um, I'll just be talking about the uh, way we've applied a complex network research perspective within uh, the Urban Connectivity Project, and these are our research questions. In general, we are just interested in uh, exploring the many ways in which sites in Roman times in southern Spain related to each other. And it's kind of to confront the hypothesis that, uh, which, which exists in archaeological literature, that um, areas that are bounded by uh, Roman uh, provincial boundaries, which are administrative boundaries, kind of have a homogenous identity, and that that identity can be confronted and contrasted against uh, a homogenous identity of other uh, periods and other provinces. Now, uh, that's obviously glossing over a lot of potential diversity within different sites and uh, how those sites relate on, on regional levels, and that's what we're trying to explore uh, through networks. Now, to do that, we've uh, collected information, archaeological data, about 200 uh, sites. And I can tell you that's a lot of information to have as an archaeologist. Uh, all this data was excavated by different people, by different institutions, and we had to uh, gather it all uh, together. Now, this, this kind of implies uh, a sampling issue, because uh, initially we had 400 sites, but 200 of those, uh, just uh, the data was just not good enough, so we decided not to go with those. Also, it's a sampling issue because uh, we're only looking at those 200 sites, and we're not looking at sites that we don't know of. Uh, now, I'm not saying that sampling issue is something unique to archaeology, but it's something we, that's very critical in archaeology and that we have to be aware of. Another issue is that 
we've collected data uh, from many different data types. Uh, we've included not only 200 sites, but about 550 different artifact types. So different types of pottery, different types of coins, different types of monumental buildings and these kind of things. And they are very often the, the field of material specialists who talk within their own kind of subdisciplines about these things very differently. Um, and another issue is uh, kind of an issue of um, uh, some things just don't preserve in the ground, right? We've only, we only see those things like baked clay, for example, or stones that don't deteriorate, deteriorate that much as uh, wooden objects or as uh, baskets, uh, woven baskets, for example. Now another issue is a chronological issue. I'd like to give the example of this coin here. This coin, uh, as archaeologists uh, uh, believe, has been circulating for about uh, tw 25 years uh, in southern Spain. But that does not mean that that coin was struck over a period of 225 years. In fact, it was struck by a very specific individual at a very specific time, working in a very specific context. Um, and we're interested in, in, in that individual. We are, we are not materialists, we're not interested in that coin as such. We are interested in what that coin can tell us about individual people in the past. Uh, we've got that issue, I mean, if we consider multiple data types, we just add up this chronological issue, but they all tell us different stories. And if we add all these things up, we can talk about the long term. And I think this is the potential contribution that archaeologists can, uh, can give to, to complex networks. Uh, science, because our data kind of implies that we can talk about long-term change, long-term evolution of complex systems. Um, and we are, as archaeologists, interested in the bigger picture, but we have to acknowledge that that emerges from particular actions like that one person striking a coin. Now, how we went about creating networks specifically is uh, like this. We are interested in how sites relate to each other, so we decided to go with the site as the smallest entity of our uh, networks. This is a, a diagram showing that site A has a certain kind of data types, like coins, inscriptions, monuments, sculpture, ceramics. Uh, in reality, we, we've identified 550 different artifact types, so it's gonna be way more fragmented. Um, but this is a diagram. Uh, if we do that for all of those sites, we make the assumption that sites are related to each other if they share artifact types, and that relationship is stronger if they share more artifact types. So we're basically modeling kind of the connectivity inherent in our data. We're modeling our data, we're not modeling anything else. Uh, we're not modeling um, uh, uh, complex systems in the past as such. Now, if we do that for all of them, we can, we can look at the uh, ego network of, of one site, for example, how it relates to every other site. This looks very scary. Uh, we can threshold this further by just looking at individual data types and how they show different patterns uh, of connectivity between sites. If we do that for all of our sites, and we just look at all of them, we get a two-mode network like this, where sites are related to artifact types because they are present on those sites. And we can explore all the data, data to the Iberian, which is the late Iron Age period, for example, um, in this one little graph. Well, one massive and very scary graph. But I think that's pretty cool. We can just represent everything in one image. Um, and we can threshold by uh, looking just at those sites, which is what we're interested in and again, split it up into different data types, revealing different patterns. And we can do this over the long term, as I said. We can do this, we can explore evolving patterns in these networks over centuries, uh, as, as, we, I mean, as far as our knowledge of the dating of those objects uh, is concerned. Now, at the top, I wrote the word system, and I just want to make it very clear that um, we are actually modeling the data. We are not representing the system as such. This data is just the material uh, reflection of uh, a complex system that might have existed in the past uh, and we can't just make a one-to-one -one relationship between those two things um, and that's kind of the challenge of archaeology and I think it's a, it's a challenge it shares with a lot of other disciplines that we go from something fundamentally static and, and something material to something that is dynamic to specific people in the past relating to each other in specific ways in specific times but only having local knowledge of the bigger thing they're part of. And together they create local communities and e eventually regional communities. And this project and, and, and archaeology in general are interested in all of these scales. Um, now I hope that we can explore these kind of things with complex networks. Now just a couple of results uh, we can, and this is an ongoing project, so these are just preliminary results, but kind of things we can expect. If we look at 
how all these sites relate to each other. When we mash up all the data together, we get some very scary uh, networks. We get very dense networks, and those are the ones at the top there. I'm not zooming in on them because they, they just look very, very similar. You know, It's just a dense ball of connections. Everything seemingly connects into everything else. There's a couple of sites that are more peripheral. The interesting thing is that those uh, core nodes, those core sites and peripheral sites, change over time. So we can see, we can see changes in our uh, data if we add it all together. Um, now let's see how that reflects in terms of our degree distribution. This is just all the periods and all the data added up together. And we get, uh, well, a two-mode uh, degree distribution, which is quite interesting as such. It shows like a, uh, just very few so uh, sites or artifact types that have a lot of connections and a lot of sites and artifact types that don't. But we are interested in this project and how sites relate to each other. So sadly, we can't use that beautiful two-mode degree distribution. We have to go with a rather shitty second one, which is the sites degree distribution. Now we can see that it's, it's very messy. Um, there's a lot of sites that are connected to a lot of other sites and, and less sites that have lower uh, connectivity. And it's a pattern that is uh, kind of constant throughout time. Always a lot of sites being related to a lot of other sites. That's just because we add everything together and some artifact types are more ubiquitous than other types. Uh, every site has a brick. And we include bricks in our project, so every site will be related to every other site. So we kind of have to threshold. Does it, is this reflected in our different data types? For the Alieni, uh, which is one of our data types, it is, for example. And, and, and notice that uh, if we look at different data types, our sample, the size of our sample, decreases significantly. Uh, for the architecture, it is as well. But for the ceramics, we get a slightly different pattern, more diversity. So let's look into that in more, uh, more detail. For the Iberian period, we get something that is very similar to those first couple of degree distributions. A lot of sites being related to a lot of other sites, and very few uh, sites that have little uh, connectivity. For the Republican period, we get a totally different uh, kind of um, degree distribution. So these things kind of jump out immediately and allow me to identify interesting patterns. So let's, let's look at the details, at specific data that creates these, uh, these patterns. Um, if we add everything up for the Iberian period, for the ceramics, we get it something like this. Again, a dense ball, everything connected to everything else, a couple of peripheral nodes. But for the Republican period, we get a totally different network. We get a network with a lot of different clusters, and those clusters emerge because uh, they share different uh, ceramic types. Different kind of vessels are present in different places, but the sites are clustered because of that presence. And also in the center of uh, that previous network here. We get a couple of sites that are more um, central than other sites that are kind of like, uh, uh, as much as, as uh, I, uh, um, I found uh, uh, hubs, I mean, these are kind of like the, the only hubs I identified in my, in my data as such, but they share artifact types with those clusters. Now, if we threshold this further to just look at the pattern that is most reflected in terms of uh, the number of artifact types, so these are all the Iberian sites that share at least three artifact types with each other. We get a totally different pattern as well. Republican period, it becomes very much fragmented in different components. Um, now, this pattern is very much a result of the change from the Iron Age period to the Roman period. For the Iron Age period, we only had uh, locally produced Iron Age pottery being distributed apparently very differently than that in the Republican period, because then we had an import of uh, Roman vessels uh, not being produced locally, but being produced somewhere else. And that introduction of those vessels changes the way our data reflects how sites might have been connected to each other. So that's like kind of an interesting thing to explore. Now, kind of touching upon the geographical side of things, um, we might assume that there's a ge geographical logic. Exploring this Iberian uh, uh, pattern on a map uh, shows that it's not geographical. And the same thing for the Republic, and there's, there doesn't seem to be like a very uh, strong geographical patterning. I'm kind of building on that, um, I'd just like to introduce very briefly another kind of approach we've uh, taken, which is looking at that geographical aspect of things. A lot of people assume that uh, natural boundaries uh, might uh, kind of create regions and, and, and connections between sites, and that's not I mean, that's not a crazy idea, um, but we did not want to uh, impose that on our data. So we decided to explore this through a visibility analysis. We calculated the visibility 
uh, and the probability of visibility from every site to the surrounding regions within a 20 kilometer radius and an overall uh, and for the overall uh, area. So we, we kind of calculated uh, with 100 <laughs> runs per site um, what the probability is of one site uh, being able to see another site and people from the other site being able to see uh, the uh, site uh, in question. And then we get networks like this. The red one represents uh, the visibility structure and the intervisibility structure uh, with different probabilities, which is not reflected here, um, of uh, um, uh, with, within a 20 kilometer radius, and the green one uh, reflects that within, uh, if we just take the entire area into account. Now, we can explore this as networks, seeing that for the Iron Age period, it's, it's quite a dense network, and then it starts to fragment as time goes on. So we can explore the structural features of a geographical hypothesis and compare this with the uh, data networks, with the archaeological data itself. Now, to sum up, this was one application, right? Uh, as I said, I, I think there, there, there's a fear, uh, I kind of fear that the, the full potential of complex networks might not emerge uh, in our discipline if we don't talk to each other. So I hope that a lot of uh, new uh, archaeological applications might actually emerge and that together we might uh, create interesting applications, but also that um, we make critical and uh, unique contributions to complex network science as such. Um, and I would like to thank you for this. Thank you very much, Tom. Um, I'd like to probably put some things into the audience. Um, I think Natalie probably thought about matrices, where is the matrix? And we will learn more about that. And the other thing is the question of granularity. I think if you look at the classification systems, right, if you, if you say, okay, all the sites that have bricks or all the museums that have paintings, obviously all museums are connected to all other museums. But if you say, okay, let's look at um, the, the artists in the paintings, or let's look at, uh, let's bin the paintings by size or something, then your network will sparsen out. And that, it will become much more interesting in a sense. And I think that's one of the, one of the areas where this kind of, um, kind of symposium can bring back and forth also from the visualization people to practitioners within the, within the field. So, are there any questions within the audience? Um, okay. Uh, hello, my name is Wouter van den Broek. Um, I'm also giving a talk later today. Um, I was wondering, it's, um, what are the kind of uh, research questions that you think or then this kind of research can answer that you cannot answer through research of other uh, material or other sources? You mean uh, what, what the data can tell us, or what the specific networks approach can yeah, tell us? Yeah, the, the networks approach. Well, it is um, the, the project, on the one hand, wanted to collect all the available data for that region for that specific time period, uh, because it has never done before. But that allows us, because we're interested in uh, urban connectivity, and how uh, not only particular sites or groups of, of two sites kind of relate to each other, and how they express their identity, but also how that kind of all uh, fitted together and created identities on a regional scale. Um, that's, that's kind of what we're interested in. So that would be the research, uh, research question. And because we're talking about connectivity, which is kind of a hot topic uh, within archaeology, um, and a networks approach is it's, it's the, the obvious way. You know? It allows us to explore, to, to be very conscious that we're talking about relationships, and also to explore aspects of those relationships. So. Um, from the start of the project, we had network analysis in mind, and it's only since the last year that we've really explored this and uh, started to see what kind, of, what kind of processes we can kind of interpret from our data. Uh, but it's really all just about being sensitive to how sites might have related to each other. Okay, there's a second question right here in the middle. My name is Katharina Zweig from the University of Heidelberg and we are method providers for network analysis and what I think that many talks here had bipartite networks and you had the problem that one artifact can make a lot of links. So we have worked on a method that tries to abstract from random connections and tries to abstract from some artifacts being more abundant than others. So if ever anyone is interested in that method, I think we can clear up the data there. Okay, let's talk later then. Yeah. <laughs> Which is, so basically, a lot of 
we all grow in orders of magnitude in the data we have available, right? So, and people who do visualization in the last year or two um, run into this problem that it doesn't fit on the page anymore. So there's a whole bunch of network filtering, backboning, that's keywords you should look at after you find a whole bunch of papers, actually. Um, so, um, Can I kind of say something on that note? Just okay. 30 seconds? So, 20, 20. 20. Okay, we're exploring this, this aspect explicitly because I said it's important for this image to represent something archaeological, something material. And at the moment we're working with different interfaces, with touchpads, we're working together with uh, specialists in archaeology specializing in visualization, but also artists. So if anyone's interested in that side of things, expressing the complexity, uh, visualizing the patterns, but also the materiality, please talk to me. Thank you. Also, you should talk to these people if you have a GIS problem, like geographic information systems, because they do it all the time, and archaeology is way more complex than anything else. Um, our next speaker is Thomas Petzold. Uh, he will talk about interlanguage linking in Wikipedia, a global dependency explorer for languages and content. And I'm very happy to present the speaker. And open the PowerPoint. <laughs>